Welcome back to the 127 Fit Podcast. Today's guest is the Vice President of Business Development at Napaws Neuro. Today's guest is Angie Nowak. Angie, I want to welcome you to the 127 Fit Podcast. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. For sure. So Angie, we're just going to jump right into things. I've got four questions that I like to ask all of my guests just to kind of get the conversational ball rolling, Mm -hmm. so to speak. The first question that I have for you is how do you start your day? Do you have a specific morning routine or morning ritual you like to stick to on most mornings? That I do. I'm a pretty creature of habit. So generally, I don't see clients um, in the morning. So I like to do a 6.30 a.m. class. I'm a pretty big class person as when I go to the gym, I tend to just kind of wander around for a while and jump on machines and lift light weights and not really push myself. So love a good class, spin, high intensity interval training, something like that. So usually do about a 45 minute hour long class, come home, um, kind of get my day going, little shower, little decaf latte, Uh don't drink caffeine, it's a sad life, have a little breakfast, yeah, and then usually I go to one of my offices, do a couple of consultations, so like learn, um, learning meetings for people about neuro, and then I go see clients. Okay, cool. I want to touch on the the movement aspect of of your morning, because I'd say probably 99% of the guests that, that I come on here uh, you know, their main movement focus comes in the morning is kind of their, their morning routine. Mm-hmm. So for you specifically, Angie, why is that movement so important to kind of start off or kickstart your day? Yeah, you know, I, I used to, it really, it's more of a scheduling thing that because I see clients in the evening, um, I, I like to start my day off with that to make sure that it actually happens. Mm-hmm. Um, and if I have it just at the start of the day, there's no excuses, no reason for, for sure. me not to do it and kind of the earlier the better for me to get it in it also you know one then you have it done so you're you're set for the rest of the day on on getting those you know that movement in for your body it also energizes me Mm -hmm. i love it um so it's the best way to start my day cool and and i'm and we'll definitely get into um i don't want to get into it right in this moment but we'll get into here later in our conversation, like just the importance of movement for like the brain function and brain yeah. health, right? So I'm sure I'm sure that's probably a little bit of, of, of that for you, for you yeah. too. Now you mentioned no caffeine. Mm-hmm. What's what's the what's the reasoning behind that? You know, I don't think that caffeine is inherently bad if people can handle it. I tend to run a little bit more high intense, a, a little on the anxious Me side, too. anyways. <laughs> so and caffeine is a synthetic stimulant, yeah. you know that we put in our bodies and for so many people it it's a it has a negative effect mm-hmm. a jittery effect mm-hmm. an anxious effect so kind of why put gasoline on a fire that's for sure that's already there so I love coffee I enjoy tea but it's just best for me to always stick with decaf I gave up caffeine several years ago and mm-hmm. it has served my body really well cool cool is is that uh is that uh, is a little bit of that too maybe um was it like kind of interrupting like your your sleep was that any part of um, it or not not really because I wouldn't drink it in the evenings, okay. but I would just, you know, be sitting at my desk or doing whatever, having heart palpitations for mm. no reason, you know, feeling really anxious about things, wondering why as I'm on my, you know, second or third cup of coffee or, yeah. you know, quad shot latte or something mm-hmm. ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And after just doing some research, I felt like, you know, if, if you're already probably a, a higher intense anxious person, cutting that out just seemed like the best decision for me. And cool. after a couple of months, once my body had re-regulated, I felt so good mm. that it just didn't make sense to ever add it back in. Awesome. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm the same way. Like I'm a, a pretty high strung dude type A and like, I, I don't drink coffee because yeah. I tell people like all the time, like, I, I don't, I don't need coffee. Yeah. Like I'm already like ready yeah. to rock and roll, you know? Yeah. So it's tough though. Cause cool. it's like a social thing for people. Like of coffee course. is such a part of our culture of course, and yeah. that's why I drink decaf because yeah, I, yeah. it still gives me this like little, little comfort thing. Mm-hmm. Although decaf mm-hmm. sucks. I mean, even when we say it doesn't, it's not the same. It doesn't yeah. taste the same, but it, it kind of gives you that extra comfort yeah, aspect. So I still enjoy it, but I agree that you, if you don't need it, you know, no need, no need to add it in. Yeah, for sure. Cool. All right, so um, the next question I have for you, Angie, is do you have a favorite book or book that you like to gift often? So a book that I like to gift often is called The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kirk. Given that because I'm in neuro, I I tend to meet a lot of people who are, you know, maybe not in the best place in life, not too many people, you know, 
a larger percent of our population who comes and sees us is in really hard situations. And The Body Keeps a Score is a great book on trauma and how the body and the brain store trauma. Mm. Um, so I've had it, I have found it to be very impactful for people. So that's a great book that I like to gift. Cool. Um, <clears throat> the next question, favorite quote, mantra, or word. And I like to kind of just preface it with we all go through different seasons in life, right? So yeah. you can take this however you would like. It could be a quote, mantra, word from maybe this current season of life, or it could be a favorite quote, mantra, word from a previous season. However you, you again, want to take that um, favorite quote, mantra, word. Yes. So 2020, I am a big New Year's resolution, not necessarily goals, but just resolutions, things you want to change. So um, when I was talking with um, two to our owners, Carly and Rachel, who are also very good friends of mine. That's Rachel Ragsdale and Carly Tor. We were talking about New Year's resolutions and what those look like. And the word that kind of kept coming to me over the last couple of months as we have gone through a lot of changes as a company has been courage. Mm -hmm. um, and that has meant something very personally for me just on having the courage to make changes and decisions that aren't necessarily easy or popular, but you know, I've, I felt that they've been right and mm -hmm. courage in finances, courage in personal life, courage in professional life. And I think that that has had a very large theme for me in the last month. And I just foresee it being a really large theme for me in, in 2020. So mm -hmm. that's this season of life. I felt like courage is speaking very loudly. That's powerful. Now, if you don't mind, like what's, and I know you, you mentioned there's, there's different changes, uh, just throughout your life, but what's kind of like been maybe one thing where you're, you're really like having to step into that courage in the sense of something that you have to work through some significant change in your life. If you don't mind sharing, like what's, what's maybe one thing that somebody that's listening to this could be like, man, like, yeah, like I'm, I'm going through that too. And I, I need to hold on to that word courage as well. Yeah. Gosh. I mean, it's, it's been happening in so many aspects of my life, actually. But uh, a big one just in, in business of having mm -hmm. to decide. I've always been a private contractor and more recently, you know, having to decide to, to move offices and make some, you know, really big changes that have had really big impacts. But mm -hmm. having courage that to kind of follow your gut in that way that not and not just on an emotional decision, but gathering all the facts and then, you know, kind of weighing things out. But then ultimately what feels right and mm -hmm. what feels just and what feels true and what feels like it's going to get you to where you want to be. Right, um, right. And, it, you know, I feel like whether it's women's intuition or, or gut or whatever it is, it, it really hasn't steered me wrong. So mm. um, that has been a really big thing over the last couple of months. We moved um, as a as a company, um, Neuroptimize now, Napause, uh, moved from an office that we were, had been at for, for several years to our new office on Santa Fe. And it's been such a great change. But a big change and you know the mm -hmm. the preface of it was really scary but um having the courage to do it has mm -hmm. had some really you know large benefits yeah some really big challenges too but really of large course. benefits yeah now uh do you because you, you kind of mentioned the new year's resolution thing is, is something that um you know is, is something that you at least look at and and and, and take note of as we go into a, a new year so do you have like for you like personally um, are you like kind of like a big goal person? Do you have like a vision board? What does that process look like for you, Angie, in regards to kind of setting out maybe the next six months or the next year or the next 10 years? I, I don't know how people set yeah. out, have a 10 year plan. I, yeah. I, I don't even have like a, a month plan, but you know, so how, do, what does that process look like for you um, in, in, in terms of goals and, and vision boards? Um, what, what's that process like? So yeah, I am a huge goal setter. I love okay. goals. Um, I like setting really high goals mm -hmm. that I, I mean, definitely achievable goals because you don't want to get frustrated, but right. I real, I'm really big for, you know, shoot for the biggest and the best and, and then set yourself up to get there, right? Mm -hmm. That it's, it's always a multiple step process. Uh -huh. So I usually break it down into like financial goals, personal goals, spiritual goals, you know, a, a bunch of different kind of facets of that. Um, and I'm not necessarily a vision board person, yeah, but yeah. kind of then breaking it down into how am I going to achieve that ultimately, right? If if my goal is to run a marathon, it's not, you know, you sign up for a marathon and then just hope that it happens. Right. You, P.S., I'm not running any marathons. I'm actually, <laughs> I'm actually not that strong of a runner. But um, uh, how are you going to get there, right? That yeah. it's, you know, you break it down day to day, week to week, and, and ultimately once you get there, then you, you will achieve your goal because you, you've set yourself up for success. For so sure. um, business, we've done that. Personal, I've done that. Um, financial, I've done that. And um, fitness, I've done that. And it's been 
it's never never mm-hmm. steered me wrong. What's what's one of your and you can out out of any category you, yeah. you want to take it. Not the business, though. Yeah. Because we're, we're, we're going to get into all the business. Yeah. Though, so not the business. Not the business. Um, any other category, whether it's fitness, spiritual, uh, personal, what's what's one of the big goals that you've set for yourself outside of business um, for 2020? So um, last year, I did my first um, several triathlons during oh, the cool. summer, which was awesome. I was a college athlete, but I'm not a, not a strong swimmer, mm-hmm. strong biker, relatively strong runner, not a strong swimmer at all. That was an interesting, you know, kind of hope I don't drown experience. <laughs> um, and I would like to do, uh, it's on my, my fitness goal to do a longer, um, a half Ironman at some point. Cool. This year, some things have kind of come up that have, you know, changed the time frame of mm-hmm. that, but... I loved it. I'm really looking forward to it. But that is definitely a, a you got to break it down day to day and week to week yeah, because it's yeah. a little bit overwhelming if you think about the whole thing at yeah, once. Yeah. So, yeah, cool. Big fitness. Are goal. you uh, is one of your goals maybe at some point to run uh, the uh, or do the triathlon there in Boulder? So they do have one in Boulder. The way that I see it though is because we are training here at altitude, it will serve me so much better to actually do the try at sea level. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So to go to California or something cool. like that, because okay. training here at altitude, I mean, you will destroy then you know at a right. a, a, anywhere at mm-hmm. sea level. Um, mm-hmm. My family is in Washington State, so when mm-hmm. I go home and I run or I bike or I swim. My lungs are like, hey, thanks for the the incredible amount of oxygen. So sure. um, that would be, yes, the one at Boulder, it would be really convenient, but I think I'd probably fare a little bit better at one at sea level. Okay, cool. cool. <clears throat> All right, so um, the, the last question is uh, favorite or most listened to podcast. And before we uh, turn on the mic, you know, I was kind of going over these these four questions to start the podcast. You said you don't really listen to podcasts. So is there maybe like a mentor or maybe one influencer or an individual out there that you really appreciate the content they put out or the message yeah. that they share? You know, I I do and I have <clears throat> I'm definitely more of a, of a reader than I am of a podcast listener, mm-hmm. but I love Beth Moore. I've done several oh, Beth yeah. Moore studies. I think she's fabulous. Um and there are, you know, tons of other people, but she has been, you know, kind of a a, a steady in my life of the amount of studies that I've done. So I really mm-hmm. Love her. She's great. Cool. Now, uh, Beth Moore, like she, she has, uh, you know, a, a pretty strong, um, like spiritual background. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm, she does. Yep. So, so what, um, cause you mentioned earlier, just as you were talking about like your different categories of mm-hmm. having courage and goals, spirit, spirituality, or, uh, the spiritual category is one of them. So, um, what is, what does that look like? And you don't, I mean, you don't have to get into like the, the whole details if you don't want to, but you know, I feel that the spiritual side of, humanity or this experience is a very very important part right yeah so like for you personally like what does that spiritual aspect of things look like for you yeah no and you're so right it does look different for everybody Mm -hmm. um my my background my um, internship for my master's was in drug and alcohol and no matter what when people are going through you know like aa or something like Mm -hmm. that there has to be some kind of higher power and for a lot of people that ends up being god you know the lord things like that they find Jesus in that way. I mean, for other people, it could be, you know, a a mountain or a tree or something like whatever higher power that is that they're kind of striving for. For me, um, I grew up in an evangelical Christian home. I love the Lord. Um, So, you know, spiritual goals for me doing a devotional, I have been, you know, kind of off the rails on not necessarily as ground in the church. My master's was Mm -hmm. um, at Colorado Christian University. I I also worked there for six years. So Mm -hmm. kind of removing myself from that, um, like, you know, kind of in-house, like always living in it to being outside of it has been a little bit different. So just kind of getting back to that Mm -hmm. um, and to those roots and that I believe it's such a a driver in my life. And so really being more grounded in that this year. Cool. Cool. Yeah. And and, I mean, the the 127 and 127 fit stands for a Bible verse and, and, you know, that's been a big part of my own personal experience and, and journey. So it's always interesting when people are willing to talk about that. Um, just kind of like their perspective. Cause you can yeah. walk up to a thousand different people on the street and say like the word spiritual or religion, and you're going to get a thousand different probably, um, explanations or stories. Right. So I appreciate you touching on that. So, um, we're going to just kind of like go into uh, your, your backstory. You've kind of already mentioned a couple things in regards to like, you know, athletics and um, stuff like that. But um, if you don't, and you mentioned growing up uh, in, in Washington. So you grew up in Washington. What were those younger years like for you, Angie? Uh, I'm assuming sports was a big part. Was there any other extracurricular activities, siblings, if you don't mind, just share a little bit about that. 
Yeah. Um, so I have two sisters, um, okay. and everybody still lives in Washington State. The lower part of Washington, southern, is called Vancouver, Washington, right above Portland, Oregon. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I have two sisters, Christina and Leah, both are married. Um, I have a stepniece, Caroline, who is my bestie. Oh, my gosh, mm-hmm. I love her so much. Um, and then my parents are there as well growing up there. I have – I'm so blessed. I have the actual best family ever. Mm-hmm. My sisters are – you know, my two best friends, obviously, you know, we probably weren't so much right. in our younger right, years. Right, there was a yeah. lot of hair pulling and a lot of, you know, hateful things. But now, especially being adults, they're the best. I also go home probably more than any other 30 year old adult ever that I'm <laughs> I'm going home this next weekend yeah, because my niece go. is in a play and I'm like, mm, why not? You know, I have the flexibility to be able to pop there as, um, as much as I can. Mm-hmm. Yes, my childhood was very um, I was big into sports, played soccer. Still play golf. Um, obviously, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm trying to be a triathlete, learning how to swim and, mm-hmm. you know, do all those things. Um, I also have a, an artistic background. I went to a, an arts academy for middle school and high school. I do have a degree in classical music. Mm. Um, clearly not, not using that necessarily right, 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 anymore, yeah. but I, I do have it. Yeah, um, cool. So, yeah, music and, and athletics were mm-hmm. really, you know, a huge part of my life, even through college. Um, yeah. I, I stopped playing sports midway through college, but I, you know, finished – have been doing music my entire life a little bit different of an outlet now Mm -hmm. for that as just you know an extracurricular it's unless you're wanting to do some kind of community theater it's hard to find kind of an outlet for that yeah yeah Yeah. now um you you mentioned you have two sisters where do you fall in regards to are you the oldest middle middle okay yeah the middle child my older sister is two years older little sister is two years younger okay cool right and then um because we already touched on kind of like the uh, you know the, the the spiritual stuff. I'm assuming that you grew up in a in a pretty strong, uh, you know, Christian home as well. Then mm-hmm. my mom is the absolute most incredible, amazing woman that I know. Extremely grounded in the Lord, and you know, mm-hmm. very much brought my sisters and I up. You know, in that way, just being uh-huh. around the church, and you know, not necessarily heavy religious, you know, but heavy, very spiritual component and having that be very personal to us. And all three of us are still, you know, very strong Christians. And that's really true in all of our lives. Um, did, did you, uh, at any point, because like I grew up in a very, uh, you know, conservative, non-denominational Christian home environment, like in, in Iowa. Right. And from my own personal experience and then other people's uh, personal experiences that I've, you know, been around or watched from afar, a lot of us will, we, we, we grow up in that environment, right? We, we all are conditioned to believe certain things and, you know, all this type of stuff from, from religion to, you know, our own education within like public schools and stuff like that. Did you ever find yourself uh, questioning um, some of those maybe beliefs that, that, that were instilled upon you as you were growing up? Did you ever have a time where, um, you know, maybe you walked away from the faith and, um, you know, really maybe struggled with, with some of the things that you were, you were taught in terms of religion or Christianity as, as you grew older? You know, I, I really, I hope that everybody does, you know, goes through a time mm-hmm. of questioning because, you know, that's really what makes it your own. That mm-hmm. if you just, you know, blindly walk in faith and never question anything you've ever been told, you know, that just you know, what kind of life is that? And what kind of religion is, or, you know, spirituality is that to make your own? So definitely there's been times in my life that have been more heavier questioning and heavier mm-hmm. wondering. Mm-hmm. Um, nope. There's really never been a time that I've been like, this is not for me. See you later. Right, right. Um, but for sure there have been times of like, you know, when was the last time I went to church? And, you know, uh-huh. when was the last time I was really, you know, in the word or, you know, surrounding myself with, you know, other people. Um, fortunately, you know, I've always had really amazing friends who have, you know, kind of pulled me back and mm-hmm. said, you know, man, is this really, you know, kind of the way that you want to be living your life and things like that. Um, so God has always been a very, you know, very heavy, very steady, um, uh, like, you know, driver in my life. But absolutely, yeah, there's been times that, you know, and years probably that I was less, um, less motivated than yeah. others. <laughs> I, yeah, I went, I went, I went off the deep end for a while. So for a little know, bit, just partied hard and said, "See you later, God." But yeah. it's cool because um, God is very faithful. God is faithful when we're faithless, and um, you know His His love never fails. You know. So um, now uh, let's talk about let's talk about uh, college. So you already, already touched on some of the things yeah. that you you uh, you know you study. Got the the, the music education, mm-hmm. um, but like, where did you go to college? What do those college years look like? I don't think we really touched on maybe like your, your main, 
um, field of study. So what did you study outside of music? Let's just uh, unfold that a little bit. Yeah, so I, being from Washington, I went to um, Oklahoma City for college, Mid-America Christian University. It's on the south side of Oklahoma City. It's a pro, it's a small um, private school mm-hmm. um, that I, I freaking loved. Mm-hmm. My first couple years were definitely more of that I'm just going to do whatever I want and, yeah, you know, yeah. kind of live in whatever life that I wanted to. Um, I had a, a pretty major thing between my um, sophomore and junior year. I went home for the summer, ended up having a skull fracture, traumatic brain injury, mm. had to take some time off of school. Um, when I came back, let me assure you, a, a brain injury does not make you smarter, but it definitely changes your, your outlook on things. And just through th- some experiences I had with that, came back, um, couldn't play soccer anymore, was but was pretty driven in a different way. Um, Finished out school there, um, which was great. Moved up to Colorado. I only applied to universities when I graduated because, like everybody, I was like, I really would love to not pay for my master's. Mm -hmm. I would love for somebody else to pay for that. Um, And when you work for a university, generally they give you some kind of a a kickback on your master's. So I took a job at Colorado Christian University. Have a master. My undergrad was in um, behavioral science and then in music as Mm -hmm. well. I have. Mm the dual there and then for my master's is in uh, clinical mental health and I am a licensed professional counselor Mm -hmm. now uh, uh, explain a little bit more about the what what you had uh, the what did you call it like a fracture or something the brain injury Mm -hmm. yeah the brain injury what because that's obviously probably going to tie into a big part of like where you're at today and everything you've got going on with uh, napause so what how did how did that happen and like more specifically what what was going on yeah, it was just, honestly, it was a, a freak accident. I, I went um, and donated blood and passed out after, you know, had donated plenty of times before. It was truly just a really weird mm. thing. Um, when I fell, I fell backwards, um, ended up breaking the occipital plate in my skull. And mm-hmm. um, if you know anything about brain injuries, when that happens, you have, you know, internal bleeding, internal swelling, which causes a whole bunch of other things with neural pathways. Um, so that was that was a pretty major bummer. Um, I was in a walker for a couple of months, was kind of relearning to do a lot of things. Um, so again, had to take some time off of school, which really the incredible thing is that one, the Lord absolutely never left my side mm-hmm. very much like, and I was, that was definitely a time of like, you know, you know, famine for me of just yeah, being, yeah. even though I was in a Christian school doing whatever I wanted, living whatever life I wanted. Yeah. Um, and, you know, wondering if I would be able to go back to school or even have the, the really the mental capacity to be able to do that changed a lot of things. That Before that, I was pretty mediocre student, very involved with school, loved mm-hmm. school, but not the academic side. Um, and when I came back, it was, it was game on. Um, mm-hmm. So truly, I, I don't believe that had that not happened, I would have had the grades to get into my master's. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, even though it was a really difficult time, it taught me so much about myself and changed so much for mm-hmm. me. I honestly believe it was like the weirdest kind of blessing. Mm-hmm. Um, I also have met so many people now and in different with different, I guess, levels of, of brain injuries from mild to, to very severe who are in just way worse um, mental capacity states than I am. And so it it gives you a whole different outlook on life and a, re- a really huge blessing that yeah. the amount of force it takes to fracture a human skull and as severe, you know, as, as the fracture is, to really have as minimal now, you know, effects still lingering is, is truly like the Lord just was like, oop, now is not your time. Right. Yeah. What, what uh, did, did, did you have like a specific uh, diagnosis from, uh, from from like passing out after you gave blood, like what what was the no, cause or reasoning? Yep, nope, just kind of a weird thing. You know okay. that sometimes when you you know when you donate blood or donate fluids or something like that, you just you know your body you stand up too quickly. Maybe you should yeah. have eaten more. You know, just kind of a weird thing. And usually because I'd never passed out before, I didn't really know what okay. was happening, so I yeah, didn't like yeah. try to sit down. I just fell over. Yeah. Um, and hit some like linoleum with cement underneath. Uh-huh. So it's kind of a bad deal. But um, nope, nothing. You know, okay. nothing. Crazy you've never, happened. You've never passed out since. Um, I'm, I'm asking because it, 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 that yeah. happens to me. Like seriously, yeah. it's happened. I got. Uh, I mean, one of the reasons why I got discharged from the Navy was um, because I passed out, and I, I've I've passed out. I think probably like now it's up to like maybe five times. Yeah. But every time I can trace it back to being dehydrated. Yeah. And 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 it's something where I'm mm-hmm. dehydrated, and then like the last couple times it's happened, it's like I'm dehydrated. Um, and then I and then I, I eat because when I was when I got discharged in the Navy, I was at Chow. I was eating, and I'd got my wisdom teeth pulled earlier that morning. So you know you can't eat, you can't drink the night before, all this different stuff. 
and but something where it's like I'm dehydrated, then I eat, and it it's, it just causes some sort of like I don't know, like Weird some reaction. shock to my system or something, and like and I pass out. Like in the last time I I did it, it was like earlier uh, this past summer, and like I knew it was coming on, and then like I woke up and I'm I'm laying in my in my kitchen like just on my back, right? So I'm yeah. just you know, that's why I'm kind of inquiring because like yeah. that stuff happens to me. So yeah, one thank you for your service in the Navy. Yeah. Um, it. You know, yeah, I, I have had a couple of incidences since. I've never fully passed out, but uh-huh. if I feel it coming on now, I just lay down on the ground, okay. like awkwardly wherever I am, because yeah, yeah. really passing out isn't going to hurt you. It's right. what you it's hit the on the way yeah. down yeah. that will. So, um, yeah, when I feel it coming on, which okay. has happened, you know, maybe two times in the last 10 years, oh, I'll okay. just lay down. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, yeah no, I, I mean, because even when I, because I'm, I'm a personal trainer, it's one of the things I do. And so in my, uh, my pre-evaluation, I'm like, do you have like seizures? Do you ever pass out? Yeah. Like, oh no! I'm like, well, I'm just asking because I yeah. I haven't had seizures, but I, said, I pass out, so that's just why I'm asking. Yeah. Like, I don't want you passing out while we're. I listen. I sure. Gym, and so. I I was gonna say yeah. For and for people who do, just lay down. It is yeah, not worth yeah, it. Just yeah, lay down. For sure. Okay. So um, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about um, you know you 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 mentioned you worked at the at the college for how yeah. many years? Uh, six years. Six I was years. With okay. The, and with then the university. kind of what what did you do? Um, what did you do at the university? Yeah, um, I was in recruitment, undergraduate recruitment. So I was a West Coast Territory manager. So it was the best job. Mm. So fun, especially for somebody right out of college. I got to travel all over the West Coast, um, working with high school students, helping them get into college, meeting tons of great people. Mm -hmm. Um, And just the travel aspect was, you know, so fun. And, you know, um, I, you know, having gone to school in Oklahoma, it was not the worst getting to travel, you know, to California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Alaska. Um, you know, had it been maybe the Midwest of, you know, of like <laughs> Iowa, Kansas, Nebraska, can, Nebraska yeah. you know, there would be really good aspects to that too, but never did somebody have to convince me to go right, to San right. Diego. I was yeah. like, all right, I'll do it. For sure. Yeah. Um, it was, it was so fun. I worked mm-hmm. with still some of my best friends, the best people in the best people in the world, mm-hmm. um, worked there. So I had a really, really amazing experience there. Um, and they allowed me to, to work full time, go to school full time. That was pretty brutal. I'm not going to lie to you. I worked there for two years before I started my master's. It was the design of the program was entirely online, but we had a whole bunch of like Zoom classes, which is like Skype. Mm -hmm. Um, We had week long intensives where you would go and be there for, you know, 12 hours a day. And so it was it was a lot. There was a lot of um, that was a pretty stressful time in life. Just a phase, you know, that it was two and a half years um, in my master's uh, working full time, going to school full time. But taught me a lot. Mm -hmm. And you, you got your master's in counseling, is that correct? Mm-hmm. Yep. What, what, ty- like, what type of counseling? Like a school counselor or? No, so clinical mental health, general oh, okay. mental health counseling. Yeah, okay. um, school mental health or like marriage and family are kind of different tracks. Oh, okay. So this is pretty general um, mental health. Okay. Now, what was, what was kind of like your, at, at that stage in your life or that, those seasons of life when you're going to college and things like that, mm-hmm. what were you kind of focused on in terms of, of career at that time? Um, you know, one, I was, I was definitely more focused on just sheerly surviving um, my life. Um, Mm -hmm. but it was interesting because about halfway through my program, my master's program, I was, you know, kind of had a a crisis of, of education of going, Oh my gosh, what if I don't want to be a counselor? I'm spending all this time. I moved to Colorado. I'm doing all these things. What if this isn't what I, what I want to do? Mm -hmm. Um, and I was really fortunate to have a a mentor of mine, a, a friend of mine who was a professor at, uh, in my grad program who knew me pretty well, knew that I had always been really, I was always really brain based. Um, yeah. and really at that point, even though I had had a brain injury, I never thought that I would get to work with brain injuries. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to be an occupational therapist. Um, you know, so I didn't really know exactly what that would look like, but sitting down and, and talking with people for 50 minutes and working through trauma and stuff just really wasn't hitting me as well. I was a real, I'm a really solution based person. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, we have a problem. How are we going to fix it? Right. Um, and he knew me pretty well. So he ended up introducing me to Carly, who is one of the owners of, um, Napaz. Mm-hmm. And so I went with him. He was getting, doing a, a QEEG brain map, a quantitative brain map with her. I went with him to, to watch that Carly and I met, um, and, you know, maybe had lunch one time that next year. Then when I graduated, she contacted me. Her and Rachel, um, the other owner, were looking mm-hmm. to add on a, a clinician to their practice. And mm-hmm. Carly's 
amazing and really intense and she said I just know that it's you and I was like I, I don't know I don't know that it's me and she was like well it is you know so prepare yourself and man she was right because here we are you know yeah, yeah. three whatever three years later you know mm -hmm. she was she was spot on so okay cool now um I didn't ask you because uh, you know you're originally from from Washington and then uh you know you said like the majority of the rest of your family is still back in Washington. Yeah. But you're out here in Colorado. You you were down in Oklahoma, right? Yep. Yeah. So um, how did you? So did was was the uh, the reason behind you getting to Colorado was that to to go get your master's degree? Was that kind of like the main? Yep. The main I reason? took the job at CCU to ultimately okay. I knew I would work there, get my master's there, and that's yep. That's exactly why I moved here. Okay. And then. Fortunately, Colorado's the best, it is good. right? I mean, yeah. Colorado's awesome. So I have also stayed because sunshine is really nice. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Um, the mountains are beautiful and obviously, a, you know, a growing career and, mm -hmm. and a company here that I love. Yeah. So compared to your, compared to your uh, sister, since you're the, you're the, you're the middle, right? Yeah. Um, so like, cause like with, with me, like all of my other siblings kind of have like the, uh, you know, pretty, pretty normal, like just kind of like, you know, mm -hmm. life or whatever, however all that is. But then I'm like completely just like out in like left field, just like the mm -hmm. wild man doing my thing. So compared to your sisters, like where, where does that kind of like play in for you? Like, are you kind of the one that's always kind of off doing different things or, or not per se? I'm probably always the one who's off doing different things. <laughs> I was both of them. Um, and they're absolutely incredible. Both yeah, brilliant. Yeah. They both, um, stayed in Washington for school, did um, kind of the track where you go to, you know, uh, community college and then to state school, which mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, they had a whole lot less loans than yeah, I did, so good call. Yeah, yeah. Um, they, yep, and then both work in technology. Mm -hmm. um, my One of my sisters works for Dell, the other one, Dell Computers, the other one mm -hmm. works for Aruba Networks. Um, so they're both, you know, doing really amazing things, but I was like, I'm going away to yeah, college. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to move to Denver. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to I'm gonna go get a master's. I'm going to work on brains. Like, it definitely, yeah, yeah. I've probably always you know marched up to a little bit different beat um uh -huh. but they're also you know incredibly supportive of, of me and yeah, come yeah. out and visit me and i mean i live in denver so yeah, you know i don't really have to convince too many people like hey you should come see me mm -hmm. here because it's awesome yeah for sure yeah for sure. i'm always it's always interesting because like uh, i have two older half siblings and then i have a younger brother and it's always fascinating to me to like look at how like siblings now my older siblings they didn't you know that's kind of different or whatever but myself and my younger brother like you know my hair is like i have like brown dark hair my brother's a redhead and like mm -hmm. we grew up in the same i mean everything's the same right yeah except for like we're like completely opposite individuals now we have like the same mannerisms like our voices sound the same and you know probably like our hand gestures different things like that there's some similarities obviously but like just who, who, like, who we are and, like, you know, the paths we've taken. And, again, like, he's, he's, he has his own family. He's, you know, doing great. But, like, we're so opposite. It always fascinates me, Angie, like, how siblings that grew up, like, in the, basically the same environment become so different. Like, yeah. so it's always interesting when I talk to my guests, like, you know, because you can get a pretty good vibe. I can, like, just having a short little conversation with somebody of kind of, like, kind of, like, how they are, right, or whatever. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's just very interesting. Do you, do you kind of, like – have you ever taken time to kind of look back and like kind of figure out why you were the one to kind of like move away and kind of like just do things a little bit different maybe than the rest of your siblings or family or, or you, not? Really? You know, yes. Um, I definitely, so I'm a big, I'm, I love the Enneagram, the wisdom of yep. the Enneagram. Uh -huh. It's a, uh -huh. um, a personality kind of like spiritual assessment. I've been using that for about 10 years. Um, learned it in college. Love it. Mm -hmm. I also have read a lot about birth order psychology mm -hmm. um, and what exactly that means to be the eldest. How many years younger is your next sibling? Where do you fall on that line? Are, even if you're the middle child, are you a boy and you have two sisters? It's different because you're mm -hmm. technically the middle child, oldest boy. There, I think there are a bunch of different reasons. Mm -hmm. um, also, just, you know, the your family, your nuclear family of origin. Like, what did that look like? And, you know... I'm really close to my family, and I think in a lot of ways it's surprising I haven't at some point moved home because mm -hmm. I'm obsessed with them. I love right, them. Right. I want to be around them all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but, no, I definitely – yeah, I have – I've definitely looked at that. My mm -hmm. sisters and I, I – we are different in a lot of ways. We are similar in a lot of ways. We're also, like, carbon copies of each other. Mm -hmm. um, all around the same height, all very blonde, all – you know, it, we're, yeah, yeah. we're all pretty athletic. So we mm -hmm. um, – we're, like, carbon visual copies of each other, but – 
yeah, we're definitely we're definitely different. Although we're all you know totally different personality types right, that right, yeah, that yeah. find a lot of common ground for a lot mm-hmm. of reasons. But my little sister is a two, the helper on the enneagram. My older sister is a seven, the enthusiast, and I'm a three, the achiever. Mm-hmm. So it also you know what motivates you and what your core motivations are also then you know help you make decisions and, and see the world through the lens that you see it. So being the achiever. I'm always chasing goals. I'm always chasing dreams. I'm always mm-hmm. trying to further myself. And for me, if that means moving or, you know, another degree or whatever, I like, I'll never let something get in my path to do that. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, if my, if my sisters, if, you know, if, a, if a, a core value is security or things like that, it, it's just going to look different. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 Cool. I like that stuff. That's good stuff. All right. <clears throat> Before we step into kind of like, uh, you know, where you're at today with, with napause and, and working with the brain and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, let's, let's just take it from maybe like post high school up to the point where you started, you know, uh, working, um, kind of more in depth in the, in the, in the, the brain side of things. Was there kind of like, so like, so the college years and then like, you know, the, the post college when you were working at the college, was there maybe one like, um, experience or, um, you know, circumstance in your life that maybe taught you something that has really catapulted, like you in the sense of like where you're at professionally and in, and in your life experience at, at this point? Oh man, I've had so many experiences. Um, one though, one that has catapulted me. Like from like the college years or like those yeah. years that you were working in, in college? I mean, aside from my head injury, which mm-hmm. was just the most impactful thing, you know, that has that has happened to me. I've also, I guess this ne- isn't necessarily an experience, but people around me. Um, I had the Dean of Students when I was um, a student at, in my undergraduate. His name is Derry Ebert. He actually, he is a, a VP at a college now in Florida, um, was really impactful for me and ended up moving to CCU, becoming, you know, the Dean of Admissions there, which is, you know, how I got a job there. He was incredibly impactful for me and really, you know, allotted me opportunities that then I ran with. Um, when I was at CCU, Jolita Martin is a huge mentor of mine who I, who I worked with there and her, you know, allotting me opportunities and just support of, you know, allowing me to do a lot of things in my master's, you know, Mm -hmm. taking, you know, Fridays or a half day or whatever to be able to go get internship hours so that I could graduate on time, you know, all these different things. Um, I've just had so many people along my path that, have been incredible that truly, mm-hmm. you know, saw, saw something in me and believed in me enough to then allot me some different opportunities to get where I am now. You know, For my, sure. my, um, my friend and, you know, our owner Carly was the same way that she, you know, saw something in me that maybe at that point, you know, I didn't necessarily mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. see in myself, but she thought, you know, that I see it and, and we got to have it, you know, you gotta, you gotta For come sure. do this. So, yeah. um, yeah, I've just had, Rather than just experiences, I've had people along my path who have just been so incredibly impactful for me and have been mentors to me, still are mentors to me, and have really, you know, pushed me along in that way and have helped kind of guide my path. That's that's awesome. And that's that's like if if there's even one thing that somebody would take away from our conversation, that's that's like the nugget I would say, because like this last year, 2019, and specifically because of this podcast, like I've realized the importance of having you know, whether you want to use the word network or not, but just having people like in your corner, right? Like there's so many doors that open up because of the people that um, are in your life because of the people you you surround yourself with. Like they say your network is your, is your net worth. Uh, And like, that's really cliche, but a lot of times things are cliche and they're said so much because there's, there's their truth, right? Yeah. So um, that, that's definitely a nugget and that's very important. For, sure. um, for, for, for all of us, but for those that are listening to your story right now, just like, you know, don't be afraid to put yourself out there and, mm-hmm. and connect with, with people and not just people that are like like-minded and live lives like you, but be willing to associate with people that are, that are, that believe in different things oh that, my gosh, you know, of look different, all that. Right. Yeah. I know that it's, it's so much like love people and be genuine to people mm-hmm. and that will just come back around. I Absolutely. mean, just, you know, being being a, a genuinely decent person, mm-hmm. you know, good person, whatever, but a decent person. I mean, you have no idea who you meet and the, and the ways in, that people impact in you and you end up impacting. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a great book um, called Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg. It's an awesome book about, like, women empowerment and leadership and, and all of this. She's the COO of, of Facebook. Um, mm-hmm. 
And she talks about like mentorship. And I, I do feel like she, you know, she talks about you're always hearing like, get a mentor and then you'll be successful. And she was more like, no, no, be successful, be somebody, do great things. And then people will want to mentor you. Mm. And I really loved that because rather than, you know, kind of sitting around going, oh, I hope somebody comes and mentors me, then I can, then I can take off, then I can do something do things right mm. and people will see that and and then and people will want to mentor Absolutely. you because of that yeah yeah the law of attraction whatever you yeah. put out you're gonna get you're back, gonna get right? back absolutely Amen. yeah all right cool so let's uh let's let's take a dive into um napause um everything um in, in terms of of the brain so first of all just kind of like share um for myself and then also the the listeners kind of like what is what, what is your guy what do you guys do at, at Napaz, like what? What is the name of the game with that business? Yes, so Napaz is a neuro, we are a neurofeedback company. Neurofeedback is essentially brainwave training. We are mm. operantly conditioning and training the brain to ultimately serve you better and work differently. Um, we treat things like anxiety, depression, ADD, bipolar, trauma, PTSD. I mean, really the amount brain injuries, the amount of things that we are able to treat with neurofeedback is pretty incredible because Mm. everything comes back to the brain, right? Right. That everything originates in the brain. If you, Mm. if your leg hurts and you take a pill, it does not go down and heal your leg, right? It blocks the pain signals in your brain. So ultimately, rather than dealing with all the symptoms and putting band-aids on everything, neurofeedback, let's just get down to it, right? Mm. Like let's go directly to the source. Mm -hmm. Um, So we start with a baseline QEEG brain map, which I was talking about earlier, a quantitative electroencephalogram. Looks and feels like me putting a swim cap on your head, filling it with electrical gel, and really taking a whole bunch of information. Very key component, there is never any electrical stimulus going into your brain. This isn't weird ECT anything, right? There's right, nothing yeah. There's nothing going in. We're only taking <laughs> taking information out. So we start with that, and really our, our QEEG tells us everything that we need to know about someone's brain. So all humans have overactivity and underactivity, right? That, and that's ultimately what is, what is causing the symptoms that we experience is overactivity in brain waves and underactivity in brain waves in different lobes of the brain. So all humans have the same brain waves. You have delta waves, which are like deep, slow, restorative relaxation sleep waves. Theta, kind of that drifting into sleep wave. You're not fully asleep, but you're not fully awake either, kind of a daydream state. Alpha is the wave that's going to help swing your brain between the fast and the slow waves, kind of a receptor wave in that way, Mm -hmm. push you into the fast, take you down into the slow. Beta should be clean, crisp, focused, motivated energy. If we have too much beta, we're overstimulated, too little, and we're under-motivated. And then high beta is literally I'm being chased by a bear, right? Mm -hmm. That is your fight or flight fastest wave activity. So unless Mm -hmm. you're actually in a dangerous situation, your brain shouldn't be producing a lot of high beta. Um, So we map the brain. It's about a 60-page report that tells us exactly where we're experiencing overactivity and underactivity. Um, These things are really deeply ingrained neural pathways in your brain, so it doesn't matter if I map somebody on the best day they've had in a while or, like, a not particularly great day, especially somebody who's coming in for anxiety. It's always like, oh, my gosh, I'm not feeling very anxious, you know, when you're doing the map. How are you going to be able to tell, right? And, and, Mm -hmm. you know, don't worry about that. We can always tell. Um, It it will show up in those patterns. So then from that, we create individualized protocols based off of that person's brain. So our treatment team um, creates these individualized protocols just for their brain that really everything we're doing is so individually tailored. Your Mm -hmm. brain map is like a fingerprint. Nobody's can look exactly like yours. So nobody's protocols can look exactly like yours. Nothing is kind of one size fit all plug and play. It's not like that at all. Um, Everything is very tailored uh, to your brain. Then we start training it, right? So, um, you know, your, your podcast, you're talking about keeping your body fit, right? That your body needs to be healthy. We so often like work so hard on the other things that we neglect the brain, Mm. right? Um, And so really, you know, mental health awareness that the brain needs to be trained just like the body needs to be trained. So if you want to keep your brain like crisp and fit and healthy, it also needs to be trained. Mm -hmm. Um, Especially if we've gotten into patterns of things that are less favorable, like anxiety, like depression, you know, things that are not serving us well. Um, So I run our Santa Fe location. I'm the lead at our Santa Fe location, um, which is on, it's 574 Santa Fe Boulevard. Um, Santa Fe Drive, just kidding. We just moved on the first, so (laughs) that's new. Um, 
And so people generally start training two times a week at the beginning. Most people do around like 40 sessions, 40 to 50 sessions of neurofeedback, which sounds like a lot. Um, when I meet people who have been in counseling for six years, I'm like, let me assure you, you've done more than, you know, 40 sessions of counseling over, you know, the span of years. And mm-hmm. I mean, I am a traditional talk therapist, right? I believe yeah, in talk yeah, therapy. Yeah. I think it's amazing. Mm-hmm. Neurofeedback is really, we're just going directly to the brain. So rather than in counseling where we're, trying to change behaviors, right? Mm. We are working on behavioral changes, really hoping that it affects the brain. Neurofeedback, we're working on the brain, knowing that it has a direct correlation with behavior, changing behavior. So we're just going straight for it. Um, So ultimately, to kind of break it down a little bit, operant conditioning, which is what we're doing. We're calling it neurofeedback. It's condensed operant conditioning for the brain. Operant conditioning, if you've ever had a puppy, right? You're not gonna try to train a puppy without treats. It's not gonna do anything. You tell it to sit, you give it a treat, it's gonna repeat yeah. that behavior because it wants that reward, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Eventually you can take away the treat and it still knows how to sit. How is that possible, right? We've re- removed the reward stimulus. That's a new neural pathway in its brain. We have neural pathways to everything, right? Mm-hmm. Every morning when you wake up, you don't have to relearn how to walk, how to talk, how to eat. You already know how to do those things. You learn them at some point, you run over those neural pathways every day and they become committed in the brain. So with neurofeedback, we're not erasing old neural pathways, we're physiologically creating new ones. And then teaching the brain, hey, only take the new ones that we've created. These are the ones that are gonna serve you well. And we create those based off of someone's map. So if someone has way too much fast wave activity, too much high beta, beta, and they're feeling super anxious, well, yeah, because they have way too much fast wave activity, not enough slow wave activity. In the most layman's of terms, we're teaching the brain less fast, more slow, right? That you need a little bit of each, you don't need a ton of one and, and none of the other, mm. right? So we do these things enough times in training sessions, and I can get into you know what those look like and everything, but we do those enough times, we commit those new neural pathways to permanency and ultimately make, I mean, drastically life-changing brain change. Mm. Dang, all right. So um, I, I, wanna, I, wanna, I wanna touch on, um, like the, the brain connection with, you know, uh, like anxiety yeah. and ADHD and stuff like that. Yeah. Like, like how, do, how does that, how does the, how does the brain, how does all of this tie into some of these, um, you know, uh, I don't want to call them issues, but some of these things that some of yeah. us struggle with, like how, how does all that tie in with, with the brain, like anxiety specifically, ADHD, yeah. some of these, these focus, um, um, type things. Yeah. So, Everything, all the the ailments, all the things that we experience, anxiety, depression, ADD, all come from pathways in the brain. Mm -hmm. Um, So anxiety can be coming from about 50 different pathways, right? It could be coming from overproduction of fast wave activity. It could be coming from overproduction of slow wave activity. It could be coming from, you know, prefrontal overactivity, occipital, you know, um, activity, prefrontal meaning in the front of your head, occipital meaning Mm -hmm. in the back. Um, That's why we do the map to figure out exactly where these things are coming from. A true pattern for ADD in the brain is actually an overproduction of theta wave activity, theta being the second to slowest wave. So sometimes when we think of ADHD or ADD, we think of like hyperactivity, right? Man, that person's bouncing off the walls. They must have a really, really fast brain. Actually, it's an overproduction of too much slow wave activity. Mm. So the brain is kind of trying to like shut down during the day. It's kind of getting sleepy, right? So we crave constant stimulus in order to stay awake. That is why you would give someone with ADD or ADHD a stimulant. Ritalin, Adderall, something like that. That's almost going to speed them up, push them over the edge. That really helps them get focused. Um, so similar that, you know, I see tons of people come in who are like, I'm, I'm ADD. I've been diagnosed with ADD. And we look at their brain map and it, it really doesn't show the same, the, probably the proper pattern for that. Going to maybe show the same symptoms, but it's not the same pattern in the brain. So, you know, I also hear, well, I didn't respond well to medication. Well, no, because your brain really isn't, it's not showing the same pattern for ADD. Same symptoms, totally different pattern. That's why with neurofeedback, diagnoses really don't matter, right? You know, I'm throwing around a lot of diagnoses because it helps people know the things that we that we treat that people come right. in with. If someone was never diagnosed with ADD and they come into my office, I'm not going to diagnose them with that. Um, it, it doesn't make a difference, right? That I don't care if you have 50 diagnoses of something. I care what your brain's telling me. Hmm. And your brain will tell me, you know, what it needs. And I'm not going to have you fill out a questionnaire and, and make some kind of, you know, 
major life diagnoses off of that. I'm going to look at your brain, what it's overproducing and underproducing, and train it based off of that, right? That if somebody, you know, came in and, and wanted to do fitness training and them saying, you know, like, I want to get to be a better runner, you're like, well, we still need to probably do a fitness test, right? See where see where you're of even course, at and probably what your body maybe even really needs, mm. you know, versus what someone else has maybe told you. So, wow. Um, so, so you're, so I, I, let me try to <laughs> make sure I'm following along yeah. correctly. So people will come into your guys' uh, uh, clinic, right? Yeah. It, it called a clinic? Yeah, Is that, clinic, okay. office. Okay, people will come into your clinic, your office, and they say, I've, by a, by a, by a physician, I've been diagnosed with, let's say, ADHD. You guys test their brain, and according to the, 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 the brain scans and the, 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 um, the uh, neurofeedback, they don't have ADHD. Is that correct? So here's what I would say. I'm not going to prove or unprove anything, right? Uh-huh. I'm not going to say, oh, your physician was wrong. I know exactly why your physician made that diagnosis. Yeah. Whether or not it show, shows a true pattern is what we're looking for, right? That someone, so rather than someone coming in and saying, hey, I've been diagnosed with ADD and me going, oh, great, you have that diagnosis. Well, I don't need to do a brain map then. I'm just going to treat it based off of that. Well, that could be coming, you know, they could have an overproduction of a different wave than theta, which is the true pattern. So I really need to see exactly what it looks like. So they can come in with the diagnoses and for sure, probably they have those, the symptoms of, you know, distractibility, you know, the, these different things, maybe yeah. motivation, whatever. Um, I'm still going to do the, the QEEG because then it shows me where that true pattern is coming from. Same thing with anxiety, right? right, right anxiety yeah. can be coming from about 50 different patterns in the brain. It doesn't mean that I'm going to look at your brain and go, you don't have anxiety. Well, you obviously do because you're experiencing it, right? Mm-hmm. That if someone says I'm ADD, ultimately ADD is a set of symptoms. Symptoms. That's why somebody diagnosed you with that. So I believe you that you have the, those set of symptoms. It just matters on where it's coming from in the brain. That's what we're looking for to figure out exactly what that pattern is, so that we can train your brain to serve you better. So how do you? So how do you? How do you train the brain? Because that's something that I that I'm fascinated by just in my own life experiences. Like I believe that like I can, like again going back to those conditioned beliefs, conditioned thoughts, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I firmly believe that as a human being, like I have control over my mind, my thoughts, my actions. And if I choose to retrain or train my brain to think a different way, to believe a different way, like I have that power within me. So from, from the, from the actually like, you know, your guys' side of things, how do you train or retrain or rewire somebody's brain? Yeah. So they come in. Um, every time someone comes in, this is after the map. So once we've created protocols for their brain, mm-hmm. they come in. And again, we usually start off training about two times a week. Right. So every time they come in, they're going to be hooked up with small copper electrodes. Those electrodes are being used just to monitor what the brain is doing. Right. So earlier I gave the example of the puppy with the treat, right? Mm-hmm. With the puppy with the treat, I can see it sit visually with my eyes. So I'm like, oh, good job. That's what I told you to do. Here's a reward. I can't see when your brain is producing more beta, more alpha, more theta, unless I'm monitoring it. Mm -hmm. So we put the electrodes on with a small amount of conductive paste um, in order to see exactly what's going on. So I'm monitoring on my computer. Then that person is always going to have a visual form of reward, watching something, an auditory form of reward, listening to something, and a tactile holding something. You're always going to be watching something, listening to something, and holding something. Those are the forms of reward in which your brain is being is being trained. So from an outside training, an exterior form of training. Um, so when I get you hooked up, um, we have different brain games. We have movies. We have shows. All of these different ways. When neurofeedback came out and, you know, the like whatever early you know 60s whenever it came out it was literally a red light and a green light and you when you're watching the red light you were not being rewarded and then the green light would pop on and you were so we've come a very long way with neurofeedback that we're literally able to watch like netflix and you know play video games with our brains and do all these really a a lot more interesting things so um let's say that somebody comes in and they're doing the plane game it's this little plane um that you watch it goes through all these tunnels faster slower um it looks very much like a video game but you don't have any type of remote control. You are controlling it with your brain. Now, you're not controlling it with thoughts. That's that's the key component. It is not you are thinking, ooh, go faster, go faster. That's not going to do anything. It's through your brain producing the wave activity ultimately that I'm asking for. Mm-hmm. Um, so 
Let's say that you um, have an overproduction of theta wave activity in the brain. Your brain produces too much theta. Not enough alpha, not enough beta. Alpha being the second fastest, beta being the, the third fastest, or the, the next fastest uh, beyond that, the fourth fastest. Um, so when I get you all hooked up and you're, you know, you're ready to go, taking a couple nice deep breaths, all the things are going, I'm going to press play on the system. <clears throat> your brain is going to naturally start producing what it always produces, right? That, you know, for people who, who are anxious, a, a lot of times what we hear, and all the time what we hear is, I can't control it, right? That it would be great if you could wake up every day and go, you know what? I don't feel like being anxious today. Hey, I don't feel like being ADD today. I, I'm, I'm just over it. Well, that'd be awesome. That's not really the case, right? That those are automatic neural pathways in our brain. That's why that's what we're training. So we're not training your thoughts. We're training your automatic wave activity. So when I hook you up and I press play, your brain's going to start producing what it's always used to producing. So it starts rapid firing theta wave activity. The difference is what I've put in my software is don't reward when we're producing theta. There's no punishment, so we're not punishing when it's producing theta. We're just not rewarding it. So mm. that plane, the little plane that you're watching, is going to be puttering along, falling off the track, going super slowly, right? That um, Or, maybe, you know, falling off the track altogether. The music you're listening to is going to be really low, and the bear you're holding, it's a stuffed animal bear, he's not going to be vibrating at all. So your brain's not getting any forms of reward. Why? Because it's not doing what I'm asking it to do. Now, we have really incredible, amazing performance-based brains, right? So when things happen, like every morning when you wake up, you don't have to tell yourself, um, open your eyes, you want to be able to see. Your eyes know they want to be able to see. It's a matter yeah. of figuring out how to do that, right? If you want to, when you're a kid and you're learning to walk, yes, your parents are rewarding you. Also, you're like, oh, I can get up faster. I can go places faster. These are automatic things in your brain. Your brain's going to figure out how to do that. So your brain is going to naturally start rapid firing different wave activity to figure out how to win this, right? Mm. The minute your brain starts producing what I'm asking you for, your plane will automatically speed up. More exhaust comes out. The music goes up. The bear vibrates. It gets all of these forms of reward telling it, yes, oh my gosh, you're doing so well. Keep going, right? Um, so then, you know, and, and we kind of go in and out of that. Then your brain's going to, you know, start producing more theta because that's what it's used to doing. So the plane will slow back down. And then it goes, oh, wait, I was getting rewarded before. What was I doing before? Oh, I was producing alpha wave activity. Okay, going to produce a little bit more alpha wave activity. So... We do these things enough times that we associate now reward, maybe for the first time ever in your brain, with these more favorable waves. So if you're producing too much theta and it doesn't get any reward when it's producing theta, it's going to stop producing as much theta. Hmm. Wow, I've never produced any alpha, but I get a ton of reward when I produce alpha. Okay, I'll start producing more alpha. So we do these things enough times that we commit ultimately permanent change in the brain and new neural pathways. Wow, dang. Some you bring the fire. You know this stuff well. It's good. Um, so something that I'm very interested in, is, and it's something that's kind of uh, come to light, I'd say probably just in the last maybe five years or so, is the is the gut-brain connection, right? Oh, yes. So I'd, I'd... <laughs> oh, yes. The gut-brain so, connection. So I'm, I'm, really, I'm really interested and fascinated by how, you know, the way we eat, what we eat, right, um, you know, sleep. Um, movement, all that, how, how that ties into our brain and brain health and things like that. But let's, let's, let's just break it down. So let's talk about the importance of, you know, our gut and the function and health of our brain. So, oh my God, the gut brain connection is, is incredible. I can't even explain to you how many people I see who have spent thousands upon thousands of dollars seeing doctors for IBS and gut issues and, you know, all these different things like, you know, all these gut related issues that come back, you know, well, there's nothing wrong. And ultimately, because you, it comes down to a brain thing, right? And not always, right? We, you know, there are a lot of people who do have true, like, yeah. you know, actual, but I've met so many people who, you know, 20 sessions into neurofeedback never talked about their gut, right? Never, never said, hey, actually, I, I struggle with, with IBS or, or bathroom issues or whatever. And then we're 20 sessions in and are going, you know what's cleared up? This. Why? Because ultimately it was being triggered by, let's say, anxiety or depression or something else, mm. right? That the brain is controlling everything. Um, so you are absolutely right. We talk a lot about, and we are, you know, we're not nutritionists. So, right. I, you know, we're not, I'm not giving a ton of like, you know, nutritionist yeah, advice, yeah. although I have some really great referral sources. Course, but yeah, yeah. sleep hygiene, right? That people's sleep is a huge 
thing that we have, you know, we're staring at our phones until the minute we go to sleep. Mm -hmm. We're having trouble falling asleep. We're, we're leaving our phones on and waking up to phone calls or or whatever that we're really, you know, we're, we're not getting good sleep hygiene, which ultimately is not serving our brain well. Mm -hmm. We're filling our bodies. And, you know, I'm not a a huge, like, don't eat anything ever, like only eat salads or whatever, you know, but, but I, I love nutrition. Um, I actually recently watched that um, documentary on Netflix called um, The Game Changers uh, about a plant-based diet. Yeah. Super interesting. I come from a family of hunters, so yeah, I'm like, yeah. what? Yeah, it was very, yeah. you know, mind-blowing of like, don't eat steak? Yeah, um, yeah. Which, but I, I loved it, um, and I, I actually am integrating a lot more plant-based, mm-hmm. um, li- a, a larger plant-based lifestyle because of that and a bunch of articles that I've read. But, yeah. you know, when you, when you meet people who aren't necessarily serving their bodies well and want their brains to change – we can definitely make brain change, right? Mm-hmm. That like that is something that I can do. The body is holistic, right? As a trainer, if somebody came in and said, I only want to train my arms, that's it. You would go, <laughs> um, no, right, <laughs> that right. doesn't make any sense, yeah, right? Yeah. Like we have to train everything. Mm-hmm. You need core strength and arm strength and leg strength and back strength. Same thing with your brain. We need this, we need the body to be holistic. And if mm-hmm. you're treating your stomach like trash and like a, you know, a dumpster fire and then expecting your brain to give you only amazing things, probably not going to be so much that, you know, a big thing for people is alcohol that it, you know, it's, we get so stressed out. What does alcohol do? It's a downer. It's a suppressant. It it, it mellows us out. Mm. It's a whole bunch of sugar and doesn't necessarily serve us well. So, and trust me, I love a glass of wine. Um, but how can we, you know, kind of balance that? So I'm all Mm -hmm. about balance and about, but ultimately serving your body well. And there's really amazing brain foods. Beets are a really amazing brain food. Walnuts are really amazing brain food that Mm. if there's way that we can kind of add components of these things into our diet, that it's not an all or nothing, right? But but if we can start adding those things in, I just think that they're going to make what we're already doing that much more successful. Mm-hmm. It's not going to be a make or break that if you don't eat beets, you're not going to, you know, neurofeedback's yeah, not going right, to do anything. Right, right. But it, it's really holistic, and we're very mm-hmm. holistic of, of taking care of everything. So so what we, just just to make sure we're, we're, uh, I'm hearing everything correctly, and, and just my own personal understanding, what we eat, does have a, a direct, um, you know, relation to like our brain function. Is that is that yes. true? Yeah, abs- and then, and absolutely. Then the, it and, is. and the health of our gut. So like you know we got the you know gut, there's gut bacteria and all all everything that we got. We're, we're starting to learn about the gut. It does directly affect our brain, right? And, and vice versa. That vice the brain versa. directly affects mm. it. So um, I've had like I said countless people come in with with, you know, who are, are, who are highly anxious or all these, you know, have all these different brain things and a big thing that ends up clearing up for them and and solving itself when they do neurofeedback is their gut issues. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's kind of, which came from the the, first, the chicken or the egg, but ultimately the brain affects the gut, the gut affects the Mm -hmm. brain. So, you know, we really, yes, we need to work on both of those things, but we, I believe that we can solve so many gut issues with brain training Mm -hmm. that, Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm somebody, I have a sensitive stomach that when I'm super anxious, I tend to have more tummy issues because my brain very directly affects my gut. Mm -hmm. Similarly, when people are eating, you know, stuff that maybe they should be gluten-free or dairy-free and they're not, they say things like, I feel really foggy. You Mm -hmm. know, I have a lot of brain fog. I don't feel clear minded. Well, probably because you're not serving your body well and giving it ultimately, you know, what it needs. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, but we're, as we're not nutritionists, I'm like, work with a nutritionist, figure that part out. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, I've had plenty of people who have seen all all the, you know, specialists for their gut. We start working on the brain, and that comes into play. Mm. Wow, that's cool. Um, I, I want to touch on sleep. You just kind of alluded to sleep hygiene, um, you know, being on our phones, you know, yeah. having a screen in front of us before we go to bed. So um, just for, for the education of the listeners, because um, this is something that I, that I you know, uh, try to preach to people. It's like, hey, like, don't be on your phone because of the blue light. But from kind of like the scientific side of things, from just your professional uh, knowledge, why shouldn't we be in front of a screen uh, right before we go to bed? And then just touch on the importance of having that, that um, uh, you know, um, right amount of sleep and things like that to to have a stronger brain and a a healthier brain. So, yeah, kind of the two part of that, not being on our phones right before we go to sleep, you're exactly right. The blue light stimulates our brain. So Mm -hmm. we're literally, and we do this all day long every day. We are staring at phones and TVs and computers and stimulating our brains. Um, 
and at least like bare min 30 minutes before you go to bed, put it down that it is not, it's not going to serve your brain well to literally be staring at a blue light and then go, okay, brain, calm down and let me go to sleep. It, Cause you've literally spent, you know, so much time stimulating your brain. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, th- I would say even like an hour before you go to bed, start do, read a book, do something else. I'm a big person, like do some guided meditation, mm-hmm. prayer time, whatever that looks like yeah, for you yeah. to just kind of start taking, bringing those brain waves down and getting your brain prepared to go to sleep rather than telling it, we need to be active. We need to stay awake. Oops, go to sleep. You, you know, that, that doesn't serve as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I work with a lot of people with neurofeedback for sleep issues who are, you know, hey, I'm doing all the things and I'm having such a hard time falling asleep. I, I wake up during the night. I, I wake not feeling rested in the morning. Your brain map will tell us those things. Even if somebody's not coming in for that, right? They're like, hey, my number one is anxiety. Um, it doesn't matter if I see a pattern for 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 poor sleep, I'm going to train that too. So again, if, if somebody come in and came into, you know, your gym and said, I only want to train my arms, we would say, that sounds nice. Mm-hmm. We got to train everything. Yeah, yeah. So somebody comes into neurofeedback, we're going to train all the things mm-hmm. holistically because yeah, we yeah. need to. Um, mm-hmm. People, you know, five, 10 sessions into neurofeedback come back and say, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm dreaming so much more vividly. I'm re- remembering my dreams. Angie, is that neurofeedback? Absolutely. That's neurofeedback. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, really big thing. Sleep is such a huge thing for people and getting an appropriate amount of sleep and allowing your body to restore itself mm-hmm. during that time, mm-hmm. yeah. critical for, for overall health, mm-hmm. not just brain health, all health, everything. Yeah, absolutely. And then kind of the, the, the last uh, component of kind of like the lifestyle of, of things that we can kind of uh, control in the sense of um, making ourselves healthier specific specifically we're talking about the brain but so we talked about nutrition sleep and then let's just talk about the importance of of regular movement in our in our lives yeah so i mean we all know the you know exercise increases endorphins endorphins make you happy you know all the things but um i'm just a huge proponent of that and the more i learn about cortisol levels and different things like that i'm a huge cardio junkie you know i'm like if i'm not sweating my face off then what am i really doing Yeah, yeah um but that's that's really not the case, right? Mm-hmm. That especially mm-hmm. when we have such higher stress levels and we are so stressed, really probably what's going to serve us better is going for a nice long walk. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah. That And so learning about that. So not just get exercise. Like, mm-hmm. yes, yes, just get exercise, but really listen to your body and, and what it needs. Um, I've been doing a lot of swimming from mm-hmm. the from the triathlons. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and I never thought that I would be a person who would love lap swimming. Um, I like love lap swimming. Mm-hmm. It is so relaxing. Yeah. And it's like 6 a.m. and me and, uh, you know, four other 85-year-old women yeah. are just like lap <laughs> swimming it up. And they're, they're, I'm like, if I can be 85 and lap swimming mm-hmm. like they do, mm-hmm. I will have done something in my life right. But, sure. but knowing and serving your body well in that way. So, and just doing things that you enjoy, mm-hmm. you know, that that's what's going to serve your body well. And that could be three days a week. When yeah. I was in my master's, I was like, two days a week. If I work out two days a week, I'm a winner, you mm-hmm. know, and just to try to, you know, help keep me sane. So if that's people going for a walk three days a week for 20 minutes and that's all you can do, do it. Right, right. It, it will give you benefit. It will mm-hmm. serve you well. Um, and difference between walking on a treadmill and walking in nature. There are mm-hmm. literal more health benefits to walking in nature versus being in a building. Right, so, right. What, what, what does, like, what does, like, movement – like, what does it actually do in terms of, like, our brain and, and, and our brain health? Yeah. So it does increase, like, endorphin and serotonin levels when we when we work out and have exercise. And, again, that's uh, there's a large spectrum of, of working out, but it right. really does increase wave activity, increase things in the brain that we need and, mm-hmm. and um, like, levels of, like I said, serotonin, endorphin yeah. Yeah. that actually do – make us happy and, yeah. and, you know, bring us things that we wouldn't necessarily. It also um, can help us sleep better and not necessarily working out right before you go to right, sleep. I don't right. think that necessarily serves your brain well, yeah. but working out at some point, you know, during the day. And for so many people, it just helps, you know, mediate stress levels that when we're w- going so hard and so fast all the time, taking that time to just focus on something else and, and work out for a little bit can kind of tire your brain and tire your body out enough to help you relax mm-hmm. some. So, Huge benefits. And, and just, just the aspect of the increase in blood flow, I mean, that, that's a, just a huge benefit there, correct? Well, definitely, yeah, for your entire body, that mm-hmm. getting, you know, getting your cardio, getting your heart working, mm-hmm. um, and increasing that blood flow to the rest of your body and to your brain. Right. Yeah. yeah. Never going to serve you serve you poorly. Right. You're always going to serve you well. Yep, of course. And, then, and that's something, I, and I want to just highlight this really quick because, um, you know, a lot of us, 
and myself included, like I, I like I get it. I, I can easily get addicted to high intensity training, whether mm-hmm. that's you know. Uh, I, I love swimming myself, but like if I go do the pool and do like 25 yard repeat, you know, all out sprints, or if I'm going to sprint up a hill, or if it's some sort of like CrossFit, like I easily can get sucked in and addicted to high intensity training. And I don't want to get into all of the, all of the, you know, all, all, all of that for me, myself personally, but you know, it's okay just to walk. Yeah. It's okay. Like my own training for myself personally, probably for the last, you know, this last year, it's been a lot of walking, low in, low intensity. It's just walking and stretching, yeah. and, and that like it, it just makes me feel better. And yeah. I've had to learn that it's okay to train that way because that's what my body wants during this season of life. And like I don't have to go and you know do like you know all this crazy lifting yeah. weights or high intensity stuff. Like I'm I'm learning. It's hard for me, but it's I'm learning the importance of just listening to my body and moving it the way that it's telling me to move. And I think. Yeah if we as human beings can just understand, like it doesn't always have to be in regards to like working out, simply move, like yeah. just move more. If you're stuck in an office, you know, after 20 minutes or 30 minutes, if you can go get a drink of water, just walk around the office, just move. And that increase in blood flow is going to help you brain wise, uh, uh, you know, just be that much healthier and stronger. Is that, is that fair to say you are a hundred percent right yep okay, when cool. I was at CCU for years I mean and you know I was a, I, I was at a desk most days I got one of those under the desk bike peddlers mm-hmm. it was like 15 bucks on Amazon yeah, yeah, and I'd yeah. get on a long phone call and just be peddling mm-hmm. it yeah. was you know low impact on my knees low impact on my body um, but it yeah it's truly just get out and and be moving and you will find benefit from that and cool. I know too that you know when we work with people who are, are dealing with you know really severe depression and stuff that can be a challenge, right? A deep challenge mm. of, of getting out of, of the house and, you know, doing things, but knowing that we're in it for the end goal, right? We're mm-hmm. in it for the long goal, not yeah. necessarily the short goal. So if yeah. it's things that can, that can serve you well, we're really big on goal setting, you know, with clients that, mm-hmm. Hey, one day this week, get out, get mm-hmm. out and go for a 20 minute walk. Awesome. One yeah. day you can do it. Mm. Now, uh, we, obviously we're, we're here in, in Denver and we're at elevation. So how does elevation um, affect positively, negatively. Um, how does elevation affect our brain? So I think a big thing with elevation, maybe more specifically with Denver, is getting dehydrated. Um, dehydration actually increases anxiety. So, mm. and I am the worst. My family always makes fun of me with drinking water. I'm the worst. And um, actually, that's a New Year's goal of mine. If I'm drinking like the two of these like giant water bottles during the day, because um, I do tend to run more anxious. Um, and I, I never freaking drink water ever. I'll drink like one cup of water a day while I'm taking my evening vitamins and I'm, I'm the worst. And, yeah, yeah. you know, I tell clients like you need to be drinking a lot more water cause it helps lubricate the brain. Mm-hmm. And ultimately it, like it is going to get everything flowing better. Yeah, so yeah. that's one thing. I mean, altitude, some people get altitude sickness and things like that. I don't think there's a huge disadvantage to living at altitude for your brain. You know, somebody else might have a different opinion, but it is easier to get dehydrated living in Denver than anywhere else. So, but, and there's millions of, of benefits drinking water, but right, a big right. thing is being, being hydrated, well hydrated will help keep you less anxious. Mm, cool. Now, um, how, how does somebody, can, can we like train like, like reading, right? Like I, like, you know, I feel that reading is a great way to challenge our brain, to train our brain um, and things like that. Is, is that is that true or not? Because like, you know, we again, we were always fed these things as we go through life. And unless we actually go do the research ourselves and like dig deep or whatever, we don't really find out if it's truthful or not. We just repeat the same thing that people have told us. But like, like I've kind of always been told and from my perspective, I feel like reading is a great way to train our brain, to challenge our brain uh, and things like that. Is that true or not? So I, I kind of have, that's like a twofold answer for me. Okay. Huge benefits to reading. Think reading is amazing. It gives you new information. Uh-huh. You already know how to read. So it's not necessarily creating a new neural pathway in mm. the brain, if that makes sense. So, mm-hmm. yeah. you're, you know, you're gaining new information in that way. If it is something, maybe a super technical book about, you know, something that you didn't know before, you do already know how to read, right? That even if you're, you know, you haven't been a runner before and you're learning how, how to be a better runner you know how to walk. Um, so neurofeedback is different in that it's literally creating new neural pathway production mm. in the brain. So, um, which, and I've read, I've read, you know, 
co- contradicting articles on neurofeedback as a prevent preventative for degenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, um, dementia. There is, I do not think that there is, is solid proof either way, whether it does not or does. Um, but I can see the evidence like, like where they're getting evidence in that it's kind of one of those, if you don't use it, you lose it, yeah, you know? Yeah, and yeah. if you really, if you stop using your brain at some point, just kind of always doing the things that you're used to doing, it, it doesn't really serve it well. So I'm a big person. I love, um, any of my brain injury clients, like, they do a lot of puzzling, you know, and things like that, where it forces your brain to look at things that don't necessarily fit together and put them together. Um, so I think that that's a really cool thing to do. I also am a puzzle nerd. I love puzzling. Um, I always make my family on, at like New Year's and Christmas put together puzzles, and I always uh-huh. pick like a ridiculous thousand piece puzzle, and they're like, no, we don't want to do it. And I'm like, let's do it. Um, so I have this big puzzle board, but mm-hmm. I think things like that. But I mean, is reading so good for you? Yes. Mm-hmm. Should do I think everybody should be reading more? Yes. Right. Right. Um, and and you know, but I also think that there's benefit to listening to like audible, you know, right, or a- right. audible, um, oh, yeah, audible yeah. books. Um, so books on tape. But you you do already know how to read, so I, I think that it's it's just a little bit different training mm. your brain that way. Okay. Now, uh, something else that I've, I've always heard is that like we use, as human beings, we use a very, very, very small percentage of, of our brain. Like the capacity and the size of our brain and all this, like we, we use a small percent. First of all, is that true? And then second of all, if that is true, how can we use more of our brain uh, so that we can just have a better experience as human beings? Yeah, um, it is true, right, okay. uh, that our brains... The, what our brains are actually capable of mm-hmm. is incredible. We, mm-hmm. you know, human beings are so amazing. And, you know, whether you believe that that came from, you know, evolution or creation or, or, or whatever, it, it ultimately, it doesn't matter yeah, that right, right. we are truly incredible beings mm-hmm. in what our brains are, are capable of. Um, yes, I think we can be using more. Do I think that neurofeedback is something that's going to make someone, you know, go from being an average person to a bionic person? No. Right, right. Um, can we increase processing speed with neurofeedback? Yes. We can break, make the brain faster and better and serve you better and and quicker and increase memory. You know, we can do all of these things, which is sounds really futuristic. It's mm-hmm. And it, it, it is. It's pretty incredible what we're able to do. Um and this is, I'm not giving a pro or against this, but I've also, you know, I've read articles and seen documentaries on, you know, different like microdosing and things like that and, and increasing kind of the ability in, in what your brain is able to do. And I'm not saying like, you know, go find something like on 16th street or whatever, but you know, I've seen, I've seen things about that and I don't, I don't think I'm not pro or against it just is. You're referring um, to like cannabis and stuff? Yep. I'm refer- okay. I, and um, like microdosing, you know, psilocybin or something oh, like that. Okay, I've, yeah, I've yeah, seen yeah. different arguments for that. I also think there's a lot of danger to that. Um, but neurofeedback is such an amazing, like safe way in mm-hmm. which to open up areas of the brain that maybe have been underactive before. Mm-hmm. You know, we have kids come in with organic learning disabilities and ultimately we're opening up and increasing wave production in areas of their brain that have been underactive before and not serving mm-hmm. them well. So that is a way that we can do that. I, we do peak performance training. You know, yeah. I have CEOs and real estate agents and consultants come in who aren't coming in necessarily because there's something wrong. They're coming in because, hey, I'm in a really, really competitive field. I just have to be better. My brain mm-hmm. needs to be faster. I need to be quicker. I need to sleep more deeply, wake more rested. We're able to do those things. Mm. Is there is there something, uh, is there like a, a, a commonality between, um, like when you when you do when you kind of like sit down and, and you go through this neurofeedback process, yeah. right? And you're you're looking at different people's their brains and brainwaves and stuff like that. Is there like um, from like all of your clientele? Is there maybe like a common uh, issue or blockage or you know something that's like kind of a, a commonality that you see with a, with a lot of clients that you guys have to kind of train or or retrain? Um, not necessarily. Oh, know okay. that every brain is amazing and different mm-hmm. and unique. Mm-hmm. I mean, we see a lot of similar patterns, right? People with overproduction of alpha, fast alpha brains tend to show similar, you know, they're really intense and their brain is really fast in these different things, but it's not, it, it doesn't make them common or, or okay. similar to each other, but it's like, oh, okay, this person has a lot of fast alpha. We call mm-hmm. it a fast alpha mm-hmm. brain. Oh, okay, this person has a lot of high beta, a high beta brain. So we do see similarities in things, but... It's not like there's one okay. one or two things, and yeah. it's like oh, most people experience this. Um, the brain, everyone's brain, is so different. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, so I, I just want to kind of like wrap things up with with this, just so that I'm 
kind of understanding and, and that everybody that's listening is understanding. So, so as individuals, as human beings, we can um, set up our lives, right, to um, create, you know, a stronger, healthier brain. Is that correct? Like our, our life, we can set up our lifestyle to really have a stronger, healthier brain. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And that, not just with neurofeedback. You right. Like people, yes, you can set up your life to have stronger, healthier, more active brains right. in many ways. Yes. Right, right. And, 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 and a lot of that, that lifestyle is going to be, you know, through the nutrition, the sleep and the movement. Like those three are going to be like huge components in regards to that healthier, stronger brain. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. I, I believe so. Okay, cool. All right. So um, is there anything, before I ask the last question, Angie, is there anything that um, you would just like to leave with the listeners or something in, in regards to the neurofeedback that we haven't touched on that you would like to touch on. Um, you know, we've had a very thorough conversation, but is there anything that, that you would like to share before I ask that last question? You know, not necessarily. I think sometimes there's some intimidation with neurofeedback mm-hmm. that, wow, that sounds really out there. Um, operant conditioning is the way that the brain learns, right? This is the way that humans learn. We're just doing it in a really condensed way. Mm -hmm. And I think that is what's so amazing about it, that we're not taking something so unnatural and trying to, you know, force the brain into doing it. We're literally reward-based training it to serve people better. So, which is why people are so responsive, why we have such an incredible, you know, high success rate with people finding very drastic change is because we're really doing something you know, pretty natural and just mm-hmm. doing it in a really condensed way. Yeah, so yeah. Um, neurofeedback is pretty passive that way that people, you don't have to do a lot cognitively to train your brain. Mm-hmm. Um, I also, being the VP of business development, I love working with people on an individual basis that, you know, um, your health, you know, kind of your health costs, you know, there is, there is you know, expenses associated with that. I love working with people on an individual basis to see, you know, kind of what we can do with that. So if people are curious and have questions to reach out and I love working with people individually. Individually. Mm-hmm. Cool. Okay. So since we're already there, why don't you, before I ask this last question, why don't you um, share where people can reach out to, to you guys, your team, and, and find out more about the, the neurofeedback, uh, NAPAWS, like just where can people find you guys and, and find out what you guys offer? Yeah, of course. So you can definitely, you can go to our, um, the website, uh, the NAPAWS website used to be formerly known as Neuroptimize. Um, website. You can also feel free to contact me directly. My number is 360-624-8474. I do really most consultations for our offices. We have nine locations in Colorado, one Mm -hmm. location in Dallas, Texas. So most people, there's going to be a location near you, especially locally, that you're able cool. to, to get into in office. We do also have remote systems. So there's just so many options for people. My consultations are free. So I'm like, it literally will cost you nothing to come in and chat with me and, you mm-hmm. know, figure out if it's if it's a right treatment plan for you. If it's not, no problem. It didn't cost you anything. If it is, it can be pretty life, life-changing. life mm-hmm. Cool. All right. So the last question, uh, what sets your soul on fire? I feel like the first word that came to my mind when like what sets your soul on fire is achieving. And it feels like that has so many like facets for me. Um, I love like achieving for me is reaching more people, like helping more people. I love, um, I'm in clinical right now. I see clients four days a week. Um, and for each client, those goals look different, right? That for some people, it might be decreasing anxiety. For kids, it might be increasing, you know, like how they're doing in school. But those feel like achievements to me. Those are wins. When people come in, you know, after 30 sessions of neuro and they're like, I don't even know who I am anymore. You know, I'm, I wake up in a good mood. I've been, you know, I've had medication resistant depression for 30 years and and my life has changed. So um, that's huge with, you know, with the way that our company is growing and how incredibly blessed we are to be doing what we're doing. Those are, those are major wins. So um, I just feel like, yeah, being with people is, is huge for me, achieving goals and being on a team, all those things just absolutely like get me going, you know, wake up in the morning, just can't wait to keep doing it. Awesome. So, um, Angie, I just want to thank you for um, sharing a little bit of your story, uh, sharing about 
uh, NAPAWS and, and all the positive impact that you guys are having, you know, here locally and, and um, you know, across the country. So thank you for hanging out with myself, the listeners. And uh, again, thank you for sharing your story. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. We appreciate it. For sure, for sure. So 127 Fit Podcast listeners, I just want to again thank you for your listening ears. I appreciate you hanging out with myself and Angie once again on the 127 Fit Podcast. If you'd like to find out more about the guests that I'm bringing on to the podcast or myself personally, you can find all of that information on Instagram at 127fit. Facebook is at Quentin Vars. LinkedIn is at Quentin Vars. If you guys would do me a huge favor and please leave a five-star rating and review and also subscribe to the podcast, that would be cool. Some of you have been listening to the podcast for quite a while and you have not left a five-star rating and written review. So please, once you get uh, done listening to the podcast, um, just go and give me uh, that five-star um, written review. That just helps more people find the podcast. That helps more people um, get positively impacted through the stories that are being shared here on the 127 Fit Podcast. If you think you would be a great guest or if you have a friend or an acquaintance you think would be a great guest or a guest for the 127 Fit Podcast, you can just send me an email or give this email out. The email is uh, 127fit at gmail.com. And as you guys are finding great value in a specific episode or episodes of the 127 Fit Podcast, as I know you are, please take that specific episode or episodes and share it on your Facebook and Instagram stories using the hashtag be someone to follow. And per the usual, I will leave you with Proverbs 24.10, which states, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. This time until next time, I will catch you guys later.